Today's message is called the Lord of the Sabbath. Jesus challenges the religious pretenses of his day and repeats once again, I desire mercy, not sacrifice. We're going to look at Luke chapter 6 this morning. Luke chapter 6. Why is is it important that we grasp this concept? that it's not only what we do, but how we do it. In other words, our hearts and our minds. This morning, if we think about religious forms of duty to the law, or rather flavors of the law, in modern day, we see it all over, don't we? In denominations such as uh, Catholicism, a laundry list of tasks for you to do, uh, the rosary beads, the confession, attending mass, baptism, all things that you have to do in order for God to grant you more grace. Do this and believe in God and you can't have one without the other. We, we even see it in the more extreme um, shades of charismaticism. <clears throat> Many of you have seen it firsthand, haven't you? Where there is this huge emphasis on being filled with the Spirit or experiencing it. Where their music worship uh, portion almost becomes ritualistic. And, and this is clearly believed <clears throat> where the right chords on the, on the guitar and the right ambience is needed to summon the Spirit of God. Similar to the Shekinah glory on Solomon's temple. And they, the Spirit becomes a genie <laughs> that you can summon with a ritual. That what, that's what it boils down to in its most, most extreme case. Do this to receive grace. <clears throat> Seventh-day Adventist, since we're talking about the Sabbath, we might as well mention them. They keep the Sabbath and excuse the irony of the word religiously. Sabbath, by the way, is not today. It's the Jewish Sabbath is from Friday evening when the sun goes down to Saturday evening when the sun goes down. <clears throat> Sunday is the first day of the week. They would go to work on a Sunday. We call this day the Lord's Day. And we gather here because this is the day that Christ rose from the grave. Not because we keep the Sabbath. I'm sure in your experiences and upbringing, <clears throat> you've experienced some form of this. Don't vacuum the house on a Sunday. Don't get a tattoo. Don't uh, cut your hair short if you're a woman. Don't let your grow, hair grow long if you're a man. Don't do this. Don't do that. Why? Because. The Bible addresses this kind of thinking with abundant clarity because the first century church experienced this same issue as well. In the book of Hebrews, the people were faced with persecution and they wanted to go back to keeping the law, something that is known and safe. And the writer of Hebrews pleads with them, there is no going back. Christ is the fulfillment of the law. There's nothing back there anymore. In the book of Galatians, false teachers infiltrated the church. And they taught that faith in Christ, as well as observance of the law, is necessary for salvation. 
Paul slammed them for even considering the notion. Jesus himself addresses this issue here in Luke chapter 6. From verse 1 to 11, there are two events or incidents here regarding the observance of the Sabbath. So it comes down to a true, humble understanding of the command in Exodus 20, verse 8, we're going to get to that, versus the religious dogmatism of their day. Now, the definition of dogmatism is, um, I'm paraphrasing, but an insistence that a certain uh, principle is uh, true regardless of evidence or regardless of um, clear disagreement or, or, or factual disagreement otherwise, okay? <clears throat> Let's remember that faith is not the same thing as blind belief. The more we read scripture, the more we, we grow in the Lord, <clears throat> For me, it's the only thing that makes sense. <clears throat> but we'll get to that. <clears throat> so he was challenging the dogmatism of his day. We Baptists, obviously, we don't have any religious hang-ups, right? We are immune to dogmatism. <laughs> no. <laughs> okay. Okay. So in this case here, it's the observance of the Sabbath. The scribes came along and added clarifications to it. So the law was simple. Keep the Sabbath, keep it holy, and rest. And then the scribes added... Um, arbitrary rules in what does it mean to rest. For example, <clears throat> um, you were not allowed to travel more than 1,000 feet from your home. I don't know why. <clears throat> it counts as labor. They decided that just arbitrarily. They added tradition. They added prescription to the word of God that was not there originally. Uh, here's another example. <clears throat> a woman was not allowed to look at herself in the mirror on the Sabbath because she might discover a gray hair and pluck it out and therefore do work. I kid you not. No exaggeration. In the words of commenter John Phillips, they added pages upon pages of endless, mind-boggling pettiness, burden heaped upon burden. So we're going to look this morning at the incidents and the accusations by the Pharisees, and then we're going to do that twice. And then we're going to consider the explanations Jesus gives they largely the same in both occurrences. And of course, ultimately, how it applies to us today. Um, okay, let's read together from verse 1 to 5. <clears throat> On the Sabbath after the first, he went through the grain fields and his Disciples plucked and ate the heads of grain, rubbing them together in their hands. Some of the Pharisees said to them, Why are you doing what is not lawful to do on the Sabbath? Jesus answered them, Have you not read what David did when he and those that were with him were hungry? He went into the house of God and took and ate the ritual bread and also gave it to those who were with him. This was not lawful, but for the priests only to eat. 
Then he said to them, The Son of Man is Lord, even of the Sabbath. <clears throat> Dear Lord, we do pray this morning that you may edify us through these words, that we may grow in knowledge and understanding and be convicted by your word this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. <clears throat> we'll look at the first story here. <clears throat> his disciples were hungry. So his disciples were walking through a wheat field on the Sabbath, and as they were passing, they decided to pick the heads of the wheat. Seeds are rich in energy, and has a lot of vitamins in, it's got air, it's uh, uh, kilojoules, uh, we eat seeds in our cereal and things, you become quite addicted to it after a while, it's, uh, it's quite nice. <clears throat> so they picked the, as they were walking, they were probably traveling, they did a lot of traveling, <clears throat> and traveling, it would be extremely difficult or burdensome to have to prepare food while traveling and then have to carry that food and what counts as your dwelling place because now we can't travel a thousand feet from our dwelling place and um, they, they, they were sleeping under the stars most of his ministry. Jesus himself attested to that. <clears throat> They were simply walking and picking heads of grain from the field as they were walking <clears throat> and then rubbing it between them so it's got the seeds mixed in with the leaves and things and you would rub it to separate the seeds from the, um, the bits of grass, you know, so you can eat it. According to the Pharisees, the accusation, they say, perhaps they were near a town, it would make sense because you don't grow wheat in the middle of nowhere. Um, perhaps the Pharisees were even on patrol. I wouldn't put it past them to see who is keeping the law. And they saw this and they said, why are your disciples doing what's, what is not lawful? You see, they had added to the clear, simple command. And they had said that if you pick the wheat, you are guilty of harvesting on the Lord's day. <clears throat> and if you rub it between your hands, you're guilty of threshing, removing the wheat from the, from the, the chaff. <clears throat> you were not allowed to spit on the ground on the Sabbath day, just in case it would make a little furrow in the ground and you would be guilty of plowing. Again, not an exaggeration. <clears throat> We're going to get to the answers. First, Let's uh, consider the second story from verse 11. Uh, not from verse 11, my apologies, from verse 6. Um, here we go. On the Sabbath, Jesus entered the synagogue and was teaching. A man was there whose right hand was withered. Right hand was withered. <clears throat> Looking for a reason to accuse Jesus, the scribes and the Pharisees were watching him closely to see if he would heal on the Sabbath. But Jesus knew their thoughts and he said to the man with the withered hand, get up and stand up among us. So he got up and stood there. Then Jesus said, I ask you, which is lawful on the Sabbath, to do good 
or to do evil, to save a life or to destroy it. And after looking at them, uh, at all of them, he said, stretch out your hand, said it to the man. He did so and it was restored. But the scribes and Pharisees, filled with rage, began to discuss with one another how they might destroy Jesus, what they might do to Jesus, it says in Luke. <clears throat> so in our second case here, we see the incident again, a man with a withered hand, perhaps born that way, perhaps due to an accident. Um, he couldn't use his hand. It wasn't life-threatening, but yet Jesus decided to extend his grace to this man regardless and to do good. He stood in front of everyone so that everyone could see, so that he can make an example of this man or through this man rather and they say they were thinking would he heal on the sabbath because again they added no one would question yes it's it's okay to do good but then they came to splitting hairs and drawing arbitrary lines in the sand once again <clears throat> it was lawful to remove a thorn from somebody or to set a bone right, but it was unlawful to administer medicine. You couldn't take medicine orally or apply medicine on a wound, but you could set a bone if it were, a bone was broken. <clears throat> and so they just, they opposed, uh, imposed arbitrary man-made constructs. And Jesus simply brought them back to the law. Is it lawful to do good or to do evil? No one would say it's lawful to do evil. No one would question what he did to the man to heal his hand was a good thing. And so as Pastor Simbiso said, they didn't have anything to say. When the Lord gives his explanation, three things stand out. That the Lord is greater than the Sabbath. That the Lord requires mercy, not sacrifice. That the Sabbath was made for man. <clears throat> so, in Luke, he does say, in uh, all three Gospels, um, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, it says, um, the Son of Man is Lord even of the Sabbath. <clears throat> and he talks about David. In Mark, he adds this. Um, in verse 27 of Mark chapter 2, he adds this to the conversation that's not recorded in Luke. Then he said to them, the Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. The Son of Man is Lord even of the Sabbath. In Matthew chapter 12, he adds something else that Luke and Mark don't specifically add. So in Matthew 12, verse 7, he says, If you had known what this meant, I desire mercy, not sacrifice, you would have not condemned the innocent. For the Son of Man is Lord even of the Sabbath. Amen. The purpose of the cross was to fulfill the law, to bring all of uh, its precepts and its rules and its regulations to its ultimate culmination. That is what the book of Hebrews teaches us. It teaches us the fulfillment of Christ in all of these uh, things that the law was meant to show us, to foreshadow Christ and to 
um, show us our need for a savior and ultimately uh, lay the ground for Christ to, <clears throat> to die on the cross and fulfill it. It is now something we, we don't live our lives by. We live our lives by the law of grace. Nothing that we do today contradicts the law. <laughs> Not at all. But we are, as the Bible said, we're, we're called to a, a higher calling. It said that the law was our, like a schoolmaster, like a teacher. When we were still children, we needed the instruction of the law as, as humans. But then, as we grew and as revelation unfolded and culminated in Christ, <clears throat> now we don't need someone to watch over our shoulders. We, are, we apply it through the grace of the Lord and, and through the power of his spirit. So he is the Lord of the Sabbath. He's greater than this singular day. The Lord requires, it says, mercy, not sacrifice. And this brings us to the example that he draws uh, to from King David. So as you read Luke, it says that, <clears throat> have you not read that King David entered the house of the Lord? In other words, the temple or the tabernacle um, of that uh, time uh, with his men. <clears throat> and it said that the priest gave them the showbread. Let's just read that again, just so that we're all on the same understanding. <clears throat> he said, and went into the house of God and took and ate the ritual bread and gave it to those who were with him. So how it worked, <clears throat> um, there was a place uh, in the temple before the holiest of holies, the priest would bake bread and consecrate it and put it out there on each Sabbath day. <clears throat> and it would stay there uh, for seven days. And then before the next Sabbath, they would remove that bread and make and consecrate some new bread to put there. And this bread, the priests would eat. They were the only ones allowed to do that. Okay? <clears throat> but then it says, King David and his men came and, and asked for food. <laughs> and the priest gave them this bread. Why would the priest do that? <clears throat> Here's what I think. I think that that priest understood that God requires mercy over sacrifice to show mercy in this regard. Helped him to see something that we can see retrospectively, retroactively. Uh, <clears throat> that the role of a king and the role of a priest overlaps greatly. That never in a formal capacity have we ever had a priest king. But in Christ, Christ will be our king and the great high priest. <clears throat> but always, in throughout the entire history of Israel, the duties of the priest and the duties of the king were very similar. They were they were connected there there was this man that stood between the nation and god <clears throat> i believe this priest <clears throat> not um breaking anyone's back over the minutia uh, of the interpretation but stepping back and seeing the bigger application of, of what scripture had to say. Yes, I think we can give this bread to our king. And they did, and they ate. He, we require mercy, not sacrifice. I believe 
that that is what Jesus is referring to. And lastly, <clears throat> that the Sabbath is made for man. It was a kind of provision for man that we might refresh our bodies by relaxing our labors, that we might have undisturbed time to seek the consolations of religion. I'm, I'm quoting from a commenter here uh, because he just says it so beautifully, to cheer him <clears throat> in the anxieties and the sorrows of a troubled world. The Sabbath was made for man in the sense that back then they were given a day to reflect on God, to put aside the, the worry and the, uh, of labor and to consecrate their attention on God and to rest. But it became such a burden for the people under the rule of the Pharisees. I can imagine how an average Jewish person would dread the Sabbath day. Just thinking about it would make him mentally exhausted. I, I can't wait for Monday. <clears throat> they decreed that uh, labor constituted, if you picked up more than the weight of a dried fig, you were lifting, you were doing labor. A dried fig, it's air. <laughs> you couldn't do anything. If I picked up this water bottle, firstly, I would have to make sure it weighs less than a dried fig. But if I can't pick it up and then pick this up as well, I would have to first put this down, then pick this up. It, it's, it's burdensome. And so Jesus brings their attention to the spirit and the purpose of the Sabbath to begin with, that it was made for man. With all of this in mind, let's think about how we can deal with our own religious presuppositions. I want to read from Colossians a few verses. Colossians chapter 2. Don't worry about the specifics. I just want us to get a general sense of the passage. Just listen intently. Think about the words as I read them. Close your eyes if you feel that helps you concentrate better. Or follow along in your Bible. Colossians chapter 2. From verse 6. <clears throat> Sorry, I just want to get it here. Okay. Therefore, just as you received Christ Jesus as Lord, continue to walk in him, rooted and built up in him, established in the faith as you were taught, and overflowing with thankfulness. See to it that no one takes you captive through philosophy and empty deception which is based on human tradition and the spiritual forces of the world rather than on Christ. Verse 9, for in Christ the fullness of the deity dwells in bodily form. Let's skip to verse 15. And I have disarmed the powers and authorities. I have made a public spectacle of them, triumphing over them by the cross. He, sorry, he has made. Therefore, let no one judge you by what you eat or drink 
or with regards to a feast or a new moon or a Sabbath. These are the shadow of things to come, but the body that costs it belongs to Christ. In other words, those who do it, the people that observe it, us, we belong to Christ. Do not let anyone who delights in false humility and the worshiping of angels disqualify you with speculation about what he has seen. <laughs> Such a person is puffed up without basis by his unspiritual mind. He has lost connection to the head from whom the whole body supported and knit together by its joints and ligaments grows as God causes it to grow. If you have died with Christ to the spiritual forces of this world, why, as though you still belong to the world, do you submit to its regulations? Do not handle do not taste, do not touch. These will all perish with use because they are based on human commands and teachings. Such restrictions indeed have an appearance of wisdom with their self-prescribed worship, their false humility and their harsh treatment of the body. But they are no value against the indulgence of the flesh. Why is it so, so, so important that we know our Bibles? Why do we study the Word of God? I have seen people wield their superior knowledge of the Bible less like a sword to defend the truth and more like a club to bash people over the head with. Why? Why should we cling to so firmly? Why should we hold on to what the word of God says? <clears throat> As we've read, <laughs> because that is our only source of truth. We must measure everything against it. So why do we? Do we do it so we can get on top of our high horse and point fingers at sinners? You know, we learn about the law and the history of Israel to teach us about the destructive power of sin that we may be compelled to turn from it. We learn about the attributes and deeds of God so that we may place our faith fully, understanding who he is and the conviction of the person of Christ. Why do we learn about Christ and the cross who, so that we can understand who, is it, who, who it is that offers us salvation and restoration? Why do we learn about his teachings and his commands? so that we may shape our values and our decisions on that foundation, choosing a partner, making career decisions, doing ethical business, raising our children. Why do we learn about the nuances of our theology and delve deeper into the interconnectedness of scripture so that we may grow more firmly in our faith and guard our church and our homes from the influences of false teaching. We never learn about God just for the sake of learning. Because we are not immune to religious presupposition. We're not immune. Baptist churches, I have heard terrifying stories that makes me sometimes ashamed to call myself an independent Baptist. People daring 
um, turning people away for daring to crush their thresholds with the unholy ESV translation. There's a reason why we use the King James, and I'm gladly, I'll gladly explain it to you, but it's not <laughs> because of this. <clears throat> People ask me, so you're a King James church, do you believe in double inspiration? And I, I want to hang my head and run out the room that people teach that the King James Version in its English form is inspired. And therefore, people must learn English. You can't have a Bible in your own translation. That's ludicrous. We are not immune to presupposition. What can we say about all of this? Imagine the weight churches give to this book as a physical mass, okay? I'm sure in some churches, if I step back and a breeze comes through, it would float away, the Bible. If we gave physical mass to this book, it would be like a feather in the wind in some churches. Other churches, yes, it would weigh a ton. Good. We do have an immense responsibility towards this book. I prepare 10 hours plus a week for this 35, 40 minutes because I need to make sure before God and before you that I deal with this as honestly and truthfully as I can to not misinform you or misguide you. In a lot of churches, it does weigh a ton, but then they use it to chain their congregations to it like a, like a ball and chain. And if you walk into these churches... See chains running through the pulpits and everyone's legs are tied to it. No, it must carry immense weight, but we stand on top of it as a foundation that we build our faith firmly on. <clears throat> we must be careful of our religious presuppositions. Examine yourselves, examine me Examine the churches that you go to and, and this church. Let us never presume that we have reached the culmination of sanctity and that we are now perfect and blameless. That is the theme that Jesus has expressed from the beginning of chapter 5. May we live out our faith humbly honestly, before God, looking to the word of God, first and foremost, for all that we do. Let's pray. <clears throat> Dear Lord, we thank you. We thank you for your word. We thank you that, as you have said, that we come to you those who are burdened. That through faith in you, we may rest. We may be at peace knowing that you are great and powerful and, and we can trust in you. And let us not trust in our worldly um, dogmatic ideas. Help us, Lord, to filter these thoughts and these concepts and test it against the word. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. <clears throat>